They... All right, welcome. I'm Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist to the Spanish and English speaking people. And uh, it's Easter time again. And uh, what I wanted to do is uh, preach a message on Easter. I thought this would be a, a great time to talk about the truth about Easter. Last year, around Christmas time, I preached a message entitled The Truth About Christmas. And uh, some people got a little angry, but other people said, Wow, I did not know that. I appreciate you preaching the truth about Christ Mass, which is basically what Christmas is. It's Christ Mass. They just take off the final S. And what Christmas is, is it's a pagan holiday. It's a pagan um, festival. It's something that the pagans remembered, and Catholicism took that pagan festival and just changed the name and tried to force it into Christianity. And so rather than worshiping Nimrod or Tammuz, oh, now we're, remem we're remembering the birth of Jesus. And so if you haven't seen that, go, go see that video, The Truth About Christmas. Well, today I want to talk about the truth about Easter. Where does Easter come from? Is Easter in the Bible? It seems like the only time that people come to church nowadays, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard a pastor say this, it's like, oh, Christmas and Easter are the only times that certain people come to church. Why is it those two, two holidays, why are they so called the most important times? And why is it people feel like, well, I owe God twice a year to show up in church, so I'll go on Christmas and I'll go on Easter. Why those two days? Well, Christmas is supposed to celebrate the birth of Christ. That's Xmas, we'd call it. I'll just abbreviate it as Xmas. It's really Christ Mass, that second S. And then the other one that we're going to talk about today is Easter. And Easter is supposed to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The problem is when you start studying the, the festival or the Feast of Easter, you know what you find out is that Easter has its roots in paganism. So I don't want to attack what many Christians think that Easter is. Because many people think of Easter as, oh, we just celebrate the day that the Lord rose from the dead. And that's what I want to celebrate. If you look at uh, last year on Easter, I preached a message, the importance of the resurrection. So many Christians, they don't think anything of Easter. They just think, oh yeah, that's the time we remember that Jesus rose from the dead. And if that's how you celebrate Easter, then praise the Lord. It's good to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But truth be known, we should... Every day should be Easter for a Christian. Every day should be a day that we remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you get a chance, go to YouTube and look up my video on why church on Sundays. The reason that we go to church on Sunday is Sunday is the day that Jesus rose. So every weekend, every well, every first of the, of the week, Sunday, is a day that we set aside to remember the resurrection. So there's not just one day in the year that we remember the resurrection of Christ. Every day of the year we should remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what does the Bible say about Easter? What, what does the Bible say about that? What I want to do is I want to take you through the Bible and show you some things. I also have a book by Alexander Hislop called The Two Babylons. I use this book as well because he talks a lot about uh, Christmas and where Christmas comes from and the pagan roots of Christmas. But what we're going to look at today is the pagan roots of Easter. Because, you know, the word Easter is a pagan word. We will see that in a minute. Now, people say, because of that, the word Easter shouldn't be in the King James Bible. Well, I believe it is there for a reason, and I'll talk about that as well. But I want to start this, this, uh, well, this morning. It's morning for me, wherever you might be watching this. Um, I want to start in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18. Now, I realize that this is written to the Jews under the law in the Old Testament. But there's a principle here. God is speaking to His people and is telling His people, the Jews, do not mix with the heathen. Do not mix with the pagans of the land and accept what they teach. And as that was a principle to them back then in the Old Testament, I believe that's a principle for us today in the New Testament. Do not mix with the heathen. Do not mix Christianity with paganism, which is what the Catholic Church has done and which is why we have the modern festival and remembrance of Easter. Because many things that people do today on this Easter day in many churches are not biblical and they are not in the Bible. They are literally pagan practices. So what we're going to do, we're going to go through the Bible first, show you some verses. We'll be going through a lot of different verses in the Bible, but I also want to show you the history of this thing called Easter. 
and how pagan Easter wants to celebrate a resurrection, but the pagan resurrection is not the resurrection of Christ. And they have pagan practices that accompany their festival of Easter. Just like Christmas has many pagan uh, festivals, the Yule Log, the decorating of the tree, they all came from paganism. Well, the same thing with Easter. The devil tries to mix Christianity with Easter so that when you celebrate the way the pagans did and you claim to be a Christian, the devil's going, <laughs> I'm getting them to do what I wanted my people to do. So we should never make the devil happy. We should never do uh, his festivals and his feasts and, and, and practice the customs of the heathen. Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I'm, excuse me, 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. I'll begin in verse 9 and go down through verse 12. Deuteronomy 18, 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. God says that the things that the heathen do are abomination to me. So do not learn their abominations. What are some of their abominations? Verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. So witchcraft, but not just witchcraft, causing your children to pass through the fire. What does that mean? We're going to look at that a little later. Verse 12, For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Now, you, not, you might not like to hear what I have to say, but there are people today, today is Easter Sunday, that are in churches, and that church is doing things that is an abomination unto God. Just as Christ's mess, Christ's mass is a mass before God. We looked at in our sermon, uh, in our teaching about the truth about Christmas, that the mass itself is an abomination unto God. So when they do the Holy Easter Mass in the Catholic Church, they are doing something that came from those pagan nations that God says is an abomination. It's actually literally making cakes to the sun god. And we will look a little bit at that as well. If you haven't seen the video on what the Bible says about Easter and don't know what I'm talking about, well, you can check that out because the mass comes from pagan, pagan Babylon. It was something that the pagans did. They cooked cakes and ate them and had drink offerings, which is nothing more than the modern day mass. And those pagans in Egypt and, and Rome and other places literally believed that their false god, Nimrod, would come into those cakes and that they were literally eating their god. What does the Catholic Church teach? Transubstantiation, that you literally eat Jesus Christ. Is that found in the Bible? No. So, we'll get to that too. We'll look at that a little bit. So, this is one command where God says, look, what the heathen do is an abomination unto me. Don't do what they do. Don't practice what they practice. Don't... Don't follow paganism. Follow God and the Bible. Now let's go to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 10. And if you remember the, the video on uh, Christmas, you'll know that I've gone to this verse a lot in Jeremiah. And we looked at how in this same verse it tells us not to have what many call Christmas trees. And so Jeremiah, chapter 10. I just want to read verse 2 and part of verse 3. You can read the rest of the verse there. Because it's, it tells us not to have Christmas trees. Not to take trees out of the forest, cut them down, and decorate them like people do in Christmas time. But in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Verse 3, For the customs of the people are vain. And I'll stop right there. The heathen. Who are the heathen? Well, the heathen are the evil people. The ones that don't know God. The ones that follow false idols and false gods. They're also called pagans. And whether you know it or not, heathen, pagans, who are they really worshiping? They worship Lucifer or Satan. Because the devil has set up a false religion for these heathens in which they learn certain customs that were taught to them by gods. The ancient gods of mythology, which are what? Nothing more than really demons. So following paganism or following the teachings of the heathen is really following the occult. And it's really following Satanism or Luciferianism. So here we just read two commands 
for Israel to not learn the way of the heathen, or of the pagans. The pagans worship false gods, which were demons. They worship Lucifer or Satan. And what we find as we study the Bible is that Christianity, not really true Christianity, I guess we'll call it Catholicism, because that's what they call it, mixed with paganism to give us Easter. And it is the word Easter that proves that, because the word Easter comes from Ishtar. Ishtar. Who is Ishtar? Well, there's so much I have to go into here, so let me go back here and show you something. Way back here in ancient times, in Genesis chapter 10, there's a kingdom called Babel, which today we know as Babylon. In that kingdom, there was a man named Nimrod who took over. He's actually found in the Bible. He's called the Mighty Hunter. Nimrod married a woman named Semiramis. Now, all idol worship and all pagan religion and practices go back to ancient Babylon. That's found in secular history. You can't deny that. Well, Nimrod and Semiramis had a child, and the name of that child was Tammuz. This made the satanic trinity, if you will, of the pagan mystery Babylon religion. You had the father Nimrod, you had in the son Tammuz, and the false spirit of Semiramis, a woman. So a man, a woman, and child. And all idol worship in the world was the woman with her child. Which, by the way, Catholicism in about 300 AD came along and started through the Roman Catholic Church. And what the Roman Catholic Church did, because they were centered in Rome, was they took many of the Roman pagan practices and mixed with paganism. So this church mixed Catholicism, which supposedly is Christianity, with paganism. And to this day, paganism. We can see that mixture. We can see those pagan practices of old from Babylonic practices mixed with Christianity today, still being celebrated in that Roman Catholic Church. Now I'll prove that to you. I'll prove that to you as we go through this book. And you can study history as well and find some things. But before we go there, um, I want you to go to Acts chapter 12 and verse 4. I just want to throw this out here first because this is important. Acts chapter 12 and verse 4. There are some people that when they come to this passage, they try to say that the King James Bible has a mistake or an error. You know, that they don't know of any other errors in the King James Bible, but many people say, see, this is a mistake in the King James Bible. This should be translated as Passover. Well, let's read it real quick, because this is the only time in the Bible that we find the word Easter. Romans chapter, I mean, Acts chapter 12, verse 4. And when he had apprehended them, he put him in prison, and delivered him to four quaternion, quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So here is the word Easter in the King James Bible. Now I told you that the word Easter is a pagan word that comes from Ishtar, and it's a pagan festival that's celebrated to remember the resurrection of Tammuz. You see, Nimrod died, and when he died, Semiramis had his son, Tammuz. And she told everyone, this is the promised seed, this is the resurrected Nimrod, this is Tammuz, worship him. And it was a false type of Christ, Tammuz. So that pagan religions, they do celebrate a resurrection, but not the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection of Tammuz. So many people say, see, the King James Bible is wrong because Easter is in the passage. It should say Pasqua or Passover. Well, I disagree. Look at the context. Look in verse 1. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews to proceed further to take Peter also, then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he ap apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quatern quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, who is this passage talking about? It's talking about Herod. Herod was a pagan. Herod was a pagan Roman who accepted and worshipped the pagan gods and the pagan feasts. So the context is Herod wanted to do something, but he was going to wait till after something to do it. Well, what feast did Herod celebrate? Was Herod a Jew that celebrated the Passover? No! 
Herod was a pagan that celebrated the false uh, festival, the evil festival, the pagan festival of Easter. So the King James Bible translators got it right by putting Easter here. Because Herod celebrated Easter. Herod did not celebrate Passover. Now with that stated, it must be said, because it's very important, that this pagan festival of Easter usually comes around April or May on the pagan calendar. Well, about the same time every year, April or May, sometimes late March, is Passover. So these two festivals usually come around the same time every year. And a lot of times they fall on about the exact same week. So some people who don't know anything, they're ignorant and think they're smart, love to attack the King James Bible saying, it's wrong, it's wrong, it should say Passover. No, it shouldn't. It should say Easter because that's what Herod was celebrating, the pagan festival. He wasn't going to the Jewish temple and celebrating the Jewish festival. So you've got to understand, the King James Bible is right. The context dictates sometimes how we translate a verse. For example, Daniel chapter 3. All new versions of the Bible, when Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego are in the fire, say that Nebuchadnezzar looked in and said, I see one as the son of the gods, plural, walking around. No, no, the King James Bible translates it as the Son of God. Because in the context, it's Jesus Christ there with them in his pre-incarnate state. And he realized that. And as a pagan, he's like, oh, that's the true God. All oh, my false gods are right. So people that want to correct the Bible, they, they need to read the context. Easter is perfectly acceptable in the King James Bible. There's no problem with the word Easter. It is not a mistake. It's not an error. In fact, it shows us who Herod was worshipping. He was worshipping Ischar. He, a pagan, was celebrating a pagan feast. Alright, so the context demands that it should say Easter. So what is this pagan feast called Easter? Where does it come from? Well, we've looked at how Babylon started the idolatry and the mystery Babylon religion. And so all these early um, nations, Egypt, and then eventually Rome, followed this false religion, this paganistic religion, of worshipping Ishtar, Semiramis. Semiramis is also called Ishtar. There's many names for her. Sibeli. Um, other names she has is Ashtarti. Maybe you've heard of her that. She is a woman goddess. And many people worship that woman. Which, by the way, the Catholic Church, when they took over, all they did was change her name to Mary. And so Catholics are really worshipping Ishtar, whether they know it or not. They just call her Mary. But she is not the Mary of the Bible who they worship. And we'll see this as we go through, and I'll read you some of this book of the two Babylons. So Easter was a pagan festival. The festival of Ishtar. And there's lots that I need to say about what they did during this festival. Let me begin reading here. This is the two Babylons, and uh, we looked at this book. This is a very, very, very smart man, Alexander Hislop in the 1800s, who did a lot of research on what the pagans preached, what the pagans believed, what the pagan mystery religions taught. And he says here, now look at Easter. Let's look at Easter. What means the term itself? It is not a Christian name. It bears a Chaldean origin in its very forehead. Easter is nothing else than Ashtarti. Now, sometimes it has an H in it, sometimes it doesn't. One of the titles of Beltis, the Queen of Heaven, whose name, as pronounced by the people of Nineveh, was evidently identical with that now in common use in this country. That name, as found by Layard on the Australian, uh, uh, Assyrian monuments, is Ishtar. The worship of Bel and Astarte, well, Bel would be Nimrod, was very early introduced into Britain along with the Druids, the priests of the groves. Some have imagined that the Druidical worship was first introduced by the Phoenicians whose century before the Christian era traded in the mines of Cornwall. From Bel, okay, so Bel is another name for Nimrod, but it's also where we get the word Baal. Bel, Baal, same thing, so who is it? It's really worshipping Nimrod, is really worshipping Satan. And it says, From Bel, the first of May is called Beltan, Beltan in the Almanac. And we have customs still lingering at this day among us which prove how exactly the worship of Bel or Moloch, huh, Moloch. You see, all these old pagan um, 
starters of the Babylon mystery religion, Nimrod and Semiramis, have many different names in many different cultures and nations. And he's known as Moloch in some places. What did they do to Moloch? The pagans used to take and offer, have you ever seen the picture, of Moloch, this giant statue with his hands out held, and they put a fire in his belly, and they bring their kids and put him in and sacrifice him through the fire. Well, we started out by reading some verses where God says, don't do this abomination, allowing your children to pass through the fire. You see how it's all connecting together? So the pagan religion, the pagan sacrifices, were sacrificing your children to these so-called gods and goddesses. And what we'll see as we study about Easter, it was a festival in which there was all these orgies to get women pregnant so that about nine months later, they could make sacrifice. Well, if you start in, in, in uh, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, nine months is December. <gasps> that, that falls on this festival. And in Christmas, they would sacrifice those babies to their false god. All the paganism is all about blood sacrifice, killing your children, making them pass through the fire. It's sick, is what it is. Now, back to... Uh, to Babylon. From Bel, the first of May, still called Beltane in the Almanac, we have customs still lingering at this day among us which prove how exactly the worship of Bel or Moloch, for both titles belong to the same God, had been observed in the northern parts of the island. He goes on, if Baal or Bel was thus worshipped in Britain, it will not be difficult to believe that his consort Astarte was also adored by our ancestors, and that from Astarte, whose name in Nineveh was Ishtar, the religious solemnities of April, as now practiced, are called by the name of Easter that month. Among our pagan ancestors, having now called, having been called Easter Monath, the festival of which we read in church history under the name of e Easter in the 3rd or 4th centuries was quite a different festival from that now observed in the Romanish church. And at that time was not known by any such name as Easter. It was called Pasch, or the Passover. And though not of apostolic institution, was very early observed by many professing Christians in commemoration of the death and resurrection of Christ. Yeah, that's what we should remember, is the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, that festival agreed originally with the time of the Jewish Passover, when Christ was crucified, a period which, in the days of Tertullian, at the end of the 2nd century, was to believed to have been around the 23rd of March. Now, it's different every year. But, there were two festivals happening at the same time every year. And so what you see is you have Satan having his people with his religion saying, worship me under the name of Baal or Bel or Moloch or whoever you want to call me, I don't care. Worship me around the time of March or April. And when you worship me, worship Ishtar. So as the Satan has his festival around March or April, God called out the children of Israel and said, I want you to be separate from the world. So while they're worshiping their feast to the devil, I want you to worship my feast to me, the Passover. So you've got these two festivals happening at the same time. One is a festival to Satan, and one is a feast to God for the Jews, the chosen people. Now, you get a chance, I've got a video online called The Seven Feasts of Israel. And one of those is Passover. I don't have time to talk about that. But do you see the two differences? There's one that's a feast of Satan, Easter, that the pagans follow. Herod was a pagan, so he would have celebrated Easter. And one is the festival or feast that God says, look, set this aside to remember me. It's the Passover. Let me continue reading here a little bit more. <clears throat> well, let me see. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Make sure I said everything. Let me read my notes. So as the pagan devil worshippers had their feast to honor Satan, so God had his people celebrate a feast to him on or around the exact same time each year. The pagan festival had a period of what they called Bacchanalian orgies. All right? Another name for this guy was Bacchus. Uh, B-A-C-C-H-U-S, or I don't know. Maybe I'm spelling it with an H when it shouldn't. But Bacchus. I remember the first time I ever went to Las Vegas when I was about 18, 19 years old with my mom. And we went to Caesar's Palace. And in Caesar's Palace, there's all these statues to all these false gods. And they all are statues of Semiramis, Tammuz, and Nimrod. 
and they had this beautiful light show up on the ceiling and the light show started every what hour or so I don't know but the thing was everyone would stop and wait for the light show and I remember the light show starts out ho 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 welcome to our Bacchanalus festival what were they doing they were literally telling you hey this is what the pagans did this is who they worshipped what was the Bacchanalian festival it was around the time of Ishtar that festival in which they had a bunch of drunken orgies. They got drunk and they fornicated. Now we're going to see in a little bit at the end of this message how that ties into Mystery of Babylon, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth, a woman who rides the beast, and it says she's full of fornications and drunkenness. So it all ties back to Babylon, okay? This false religious festival. Bacchus. So, like I told you, what these people did during this time was they got together in this festival and they, and they had orgies and it was all about getting a woman pregnant. It was all about fertility. You see, she was the fertility goddess. And in Ephesians, it said, Great is Diana, the god of the Ephesians. So this, this is another name, was Diana. Diana was a goddess which had something like 19 breasts. And you came to her. She was the goddess of fertility. Ugh. Either, when you study it out, it's sick what these pagans worshipped. It was a religion that worshipped a woman and a religion that, that worshipped through sex. And it was all about sex and fornication. So you've got these, these festivals. Now, what these pagans celebrated before Easter was a time, now watch this, of 40 days of abstinence. And they would take these 40 days and they would say, now we're going to abstain from sex. For 40 days we're going to do what we can to not fornicate. And then once those 40 days were over, then they'd say, okay, now let's go out and just do whatever we want. Get completely drunk. Have orgies, do fornication, and just do whatever we want and let it go. And that's what they did in this pet festival of Ishtar, or Easter. It was a sex fest in which they just got out and, and just let go of all their inhibitions. You know what's interesting? Today we have something very similar. It's called Mardi Gras. And Mardi Gras is all about going out and getting drunk and doing you know what. You go to New Orleans, what do you see? The women are all, yeah, raising up their shirts to show certain parts of their bodies because they're still celebrating this pagan sex fest thing. So it all ties together. It all ties together. Now, the Catholics, huh, they, they have a thing they call Lent, in which they say you have to spend 40 days of abstinence, and then when it comes to Easter time, then you can go out and get drunk. Then you can do this. You, they used to teach you can't eat meat and things like that. Do you see how paganism mixed with Christianity to form the Roman Catholic Church? And so a lot of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church are not from God in the Bible. They're from Lucifer! Because they come from pagan Babylonic or Babylon religion. So let me continue reading here as he continues about Easter. He says here, Whence then came this observance, this observance of, of 40 days? The 40 days abstinence of Lent was directly borrowed from the worshippers of the Babylonian goddess. Um, goddess has two D's, but I... I don't even honor her, so I'll just leave one. I don't care. And it says, Such a Lent of 40 days in the spring of the year is still observed by the Yazidis or pagan devil worshippers of Khoristan. Do you get it yet? The worship of Nimrod, Simiramis, Tammuz is a worship of Satan, Lucifer, the devil. Paganism, heathen practices and teachings are worshiping Satan and not God. Now it says, Who have inherited it, what? The feast of Lent of 30 days of abstinence from the early masters the Babylon. Such a Lent of 40 days was held in spring by the pagan Mexicans for thus we read in Humboldt where he gives an account of Mexican observances. Three days after the ver vernal equinox began a solemn fast of 40 days in honor of the sun. Such a Lent of 40 days was observed in Egypt as may be seen on consulting Wilkinson's Egyptians. This Egyptian Lent, Lent of 40 days we are informed by Lancier in his Sabian resources was held expressly in commemoration of Adonis or Osiris. Adonis, Osiris, another names for Tammuz, the great mediatorial god. Now watch it. At the same time, the rape of 
proserpine seems to have been commemorated in, in a similar manner. For Julius Firmicus informs us that for 40 nights the wailing for prosperine continued. And from Arnobius we learn that the fast which the pagans observed called Castus or the sacred fast was by the Christians in his time believed to have been primarily in imitation of the long fast of Ceres. Ceres is another name for Semiramis. I guess I'll write that up here too. So many names that the pagans give to their false gods, it's hard to keep up. But they all apply to this woman who literally lived. And it says here, <clears throat> uh, let's see, I lost my place here. When for many days she determinedly refused to eat on account of her excess of sorrow. Oh, when Nimrod died, she was so sorrowful, so for 40 days she didn't eat anything. That's what they claim. Um, it says here, as the stories of Bacchus or Adonis and Prosperpine, though originally distinct, were made to join on and fit in to one another, so that Bacchus was called Liber, Liberty. And you're free through the Bacchanalian um, festival of just letting yourself go and committing fornication and drunkenness. It continues here. Among the pagans, this Lent, this 40 days of abstinence, seems to have been an indispensable pre preliminary to the great annual festival in commemoration of the death and resurrection of Tammuz. <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. It's right there. So just as we today, Christians, remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, centuries, millennia before, Satan had a false religion set up to remember the death and the burial and the resurrection of Nimrod through Tammuz, the false Christianity. And it says here, which was celebrated by alternate weeping and rejoicing, and which in many countries was considerably later than the Christian festival being observed in Palestine and Assyria in June, therefore called the month of Tammuz, in Egypt about the middle of May, and in Britain sometime in April. So you have here this festival. What did the pagans do during this 40 days of Lent? They would run around weeping, crying, well, the Catholics saw that in paganism and says, hey, that's pretty cool. Let's adopt that for Christianity. And let's just tell everybody to go around and feel sorry for your sins. Um, why would you even celebrate that pagan festival when it's not even in the Bible? Now, what we find in the Bible is this. Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 14. The children of Israel, when they went into apostasy and disobeyed God, you know what they did? accepted the pagan practices and in the Bible we find that they celebrated this 40 years of Lent, Israel and they were wrong to do so and God said he hated it look at uh, Ezekiel chapter 8, let me start in verse 13 he said also unto me, turn thee yet again and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do remember God said when we started this out in Deuteronomy, do not learn the way of the heathen do not do what they do in those nations because they are abominations unto me. What's one of the abominations? Here it tells us, verse 13. Look at the abominations, Ezekiel, that they're doing. Verse 14, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. And God was angry. Verse 15, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. In verse 16, what is the greater abomination? They worship the Son. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. S-O-N. Well, this over here, Tammuz, he's said to be the Sun God. The S-U-N. And so the pagans worshipped him, and what they would do, and we're about to get to it, and it's, it's amazing, they would bake little cakes or cookies that looked like the Sun and they would eat it and celebrate their sun god, Tammuz. Sounds a lot like the Catholic Mass. Maybe we should call it the Catholic Mess because it's not from God, it's from paganism. So when you understand this, you see how pagan practices entered into so-called Christianity. The pagans would spend time weeping for Tammuz. The pagans wholeheartedly adopted this false Babylonian religion of worshipping Tammuz and Semiramis, which is the woman with child. And all pagan religions always has a woman with a child usually giving suck to her baby. And they worship Tammuz and Semiramis. And so this festival 
of Ishtar, of Easter, was after that 40 days of abstinence. So for 40 days they were waiting and waiting and waiting, and when that 40 days were up, they said, All right! Now we can celebrate Bacchus. Come here, woman! We're going to fornicate. And that's what they did. After those 40 days of waiting, the celebration of Easter, the celebration of this pagan festival, was a sex fest and an orgy of drunkenness and evil and wickedness. What was the intention? The intention was fertility. The intention was get a woman pregnant so you could have a child, which was a type of Tammuz. And then on the other solemn feast of the paganists, Christmas, nine months later, you go sacrifice that child to Moloch. Paganism is sick. It's a false religion. It's a wicked religion. It's a religion of sex and evil. It's a religion of sacrificing your children and killing them on the altar to Satan. If you look at Satanism today, you know what it is? Do as thou wilt is the whole of the law, the Satanists say. They practice celebrating their false god Satan through orgies. And what do they do? The highest thing you can do in Satanism is find a baby and sacrifice it to Lucifer. So you have true salvation, true religion, the true God, Jesus. And we celebrate the resurrection. But look how Satan, for a century, for millennia before, has set up his false religion. And how he's mixed it with Christianity. Who are you worshipping when you celebrate Easter? Are you worshipping Jesus Christ? Or are you worshipping the false Christ? The devil's Christ, Tammuz. Let me read some more for you, for you here. Um, <clears throat> this is all going to tie in together because there are some things that take place during Easter which are not of God. One of those is Easter eggs. One of those is hot cross buns. One of those is the old Easter bunny. Now you know what's sick to me? None of those are found in the Bible. But I drive down the road of my town, go to the next town, go to the next town, look at all the Southern Baptist churches. Hey, come to church for the Easter egg hunt on such and such a day. And I say, oh my gosh. Why are they celebrating Easter eggs? Why do they have, come see the Easter Bunny in church this Sunday? When that's never found once in the Bible, but it's found in Lucifer's religion. Why are they allowing Lucifer's religion to mix and get into the church. Where do these things come from? Let me read that to you. Page 107. Oops, I just grabbed my hymn book, sorry. Um, page 107 here. It says, Such is the history of Easter. What is it? It's from a pagan religion, a false religion, with Lent which Catholicism adopted and allows time of Lent. Such is the history of Easter. The popular observances that still attend the period of its celebration amply confirm the testimony of history as to its Babylonian character. The hot cross buns of Good Friday. Now, some of you don't remember hot cross buns, but I remember as a kid. There's a song, hot cross buns, and it always had to do with Easter. Um, of Good Friday and the dyed eggs of Pasch or Easter Sunday figured in this Chaldean rites just as they do now. The buns, known too by the identical name, were used in the worship of the Queen of Heaven, the goddess Easter or Istar. As early as the days of Kekrops, the founder of Athens, that is 1500 years before the Christian era. Now he's got all these pictures. This is a neat, neat book. If you don't have it, Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons, you need to get this book. And he shows the pagans worship eggs. Why? Because egg is a symbol of a birth. A rebirth. They worship buns. Why? We're about to see in a minute that one of the words is bones, or but it's pronounced buns. They worship bunnies. Why do they worship bunnies? Because a bunny is very fertile. You know, if you have two bunnies, a male and a female, before long you'll have more bunnies than you want because they, they reproduce quickly. Isn't it funny that in the Playboy Mansion they call them bunnies? When they run around, what's the Playboy Mansion? It's the seat of Satan, of, of fornication, sex fests, bunnies. Bunnies and eggs all, all tied in with this mystery Babylon sex fest religion. Look at what I just read to you, though. It says here, 
the Queen of Heaven. Hmm. Is there a Bible verse that mentions the Queen of Heaven? Matter of fact, there is. Jeremiah chapter 7. If you get a chance, please look with me at this. Because what we find as we study this out is that the Catholic Church is a pagan church that mixed paganism from Rome, that's why they're so proud to call themselves the Roman Catholic Church, with Christianity. When you do that, you let Satan right in the door. The Catholic Church calls Mary the Queen of Heaven. But this woman, Semiramis, or Ishtar, thousands and thousands of years before was called the Queen of Heaven. And in Jeremiah 7, 18, we read, The children gather together, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven, and pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Jeremiah 44, 17. God says, I get angry when they practice this satanic religion and the customs of the heathen, because this is not what God wants. In Jeremiah 44, 17, we read, But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done. We and our fathers, our kings, and our princes, in the cities of Judah, and in the streets of Jerusalem, for then we had plenty of victuals, and were well, and saw no evil. 18. But since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things that have been consumed by the sword and the famine. Verse 19. When we burn incense to the Queen of Heaven, it says they made cakes to worship her. So they sinned against God, those ancient Israel, Israelites, by accepting the false religion rather than God and His Word. And what did they do when they worshipped the Queen of Heaven? They made cakes. I guess we could call them wafers, if you will. They were round, and if you study history and the Egyptians and the Babylonians, they all had this religion, and also they had drink offerings. Hmm. And what they did is they would get together, and what Babylon would do is they'd say, well, come to us, because we are the way to God, and the way to God is take this cake and eat it, and then that cake is literally Tammuz, the sun god, and you will have God inside of you. You know what that is? That's the Mass. The Roman Catholic Mass is a copy of the Babylonian offering to Tammuz. That's sick. Nowhere in the Bible are we told to go to the Mass. But the Catholic Church tells us, no, you must go to the Mass. You must go to the Mass because when you take the Mass and you take that wafer and Jesus comes inside of you, then you're forgiven of your sins. Go to Hebrews chapter 10 with me. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 12, prove that the mass is not of God, it's of Satan. Hebrews 10, 10 says, By the which will we are sanctified for the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus Christ offered up his body once. But they say the mass is a sacrifice continually, and they say that's the body of Christ. But what does it say? Verse 11, And every priest standeth daily ministering, and oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. The sacrifice of mass can never take away sin. 12, but this man, Jesus, after had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Now what does the Mass teach? The Catholics say the Mass is a sacrifice of Jesus. And they say through transubstantiation, they literally reach up into heaven and pull Jesus down and force him into a little cookie. And then they say, you eat Jesus Christ. And they say that can take away your sins. And the Bible says, no. Jesus is set down on the right hand of the Father, one sacrifice, forever, no other sacrifices. So where did the Catholics get this teaching of the Mass? From the Bible? No! They went back over here to Babylon and said, wow, that's pretty cool. Let's accept that false religious practice and apply it to us and call it Christian. And let's take these two most holy feasts of the pagan religion, Christmas and Easter, and let's make them our most holy days for Christianity. And let's take Nimrod and Semiramis and Tammuz, and let's just change the names. Oh, oh, Joseph would go really good right here for Nimrod. Mary, yeah, Mary would be a really good name for this woman. Tammuz, oh, let's just call him Jesus. And let's go on and continue the same 
pagan false religious practices that our forefathers did when they worshipped Satan. But let's call ourselves Christians when we do it. And that, my friend, is the Roman Catholic Church. A false religious pagan church that does not practice the things of God, but the things of Satan. Now, let me continue reading here. It says, one species of sacred bread, what these cookies are, these cakes, were used to offer to the gods of great antiquity and were called bone, which is pronounced bun. That's where the word bun comes from, from the pagan practice of making these cakes to the false gods, the queen of heaven. And he continues here, he says, the origin of the posh Pasch eggs is just as clear. The ancient Druids bore an egg as a sacred emblem of their order. In the Dionysian are mysteries of Bacchus. By the way, Bacchus, another name for Bacchus, was Dionysus. And it says, uh, the mysteries of Bacchus, as celebrated in Athens, one part of the nocturnal ceremony consisted in the consecration of an egg. The Hindu fables celebrate their mundane egg as a golden color. The people of Japan make their sacred egg to have been brazen. In China, at this hour, dyed or painted eggs are used on sacred festivals, even in this country. What is the big deal for many Christians on Easter? Oh, let's go dye some Easter eggs. You have fun doing that because that came from Satan, not from God. Yeah, I won't be helping you with that. You know, as a kid, I remember once or twice going to an Easter egg hunt. But then my dad got saved and got this book. And I remember as a kid, our parents wouldn't let us go to Easter egg hunts. And I always say, why? And they said, well, it's part of a false religion. It's not from the Bible. You know, I'm 41 years old, and I look back on that and I say, thank God! Thank God I had parents that loved God enough that when they saw the truth, they said, I ain't going with Lucifer. I'm going to go with Jesus. I'm not going to celebrate and worship the sacred egg. Well, Continue on here about the egg. It says, The classic poets are full of the fable of the mystic egg of the Babylonians. And thus its tale is told by Hygenius, the Egyptian learned keeper of the Palatine Library at Rome. In the time of Augustus, who was skilled in all the wisdom of his native country, an egg of wondrous size is said to have fallen from heaven into the river Euphrates. The fishes rolled it to the bank, where the doves, having settled upon it and hatched it out, came Venus, who afterwards is called the Syrian goddess Ashtar. So, it's called by paganism the sacred egg of paganism. You call yourself a Christian. You love to decorate eggs on Easter. Do you realize you're decorating something and doing the same practice that people who worship Satan and sacrifice their children to Satan did? You think God is pleased with that? I don't. I don't think God is pleased with that at all. At all. Page 110. Now the Romanish church adopted this mystic egg of Astarte and consecrated it as a symbol of Christ's resurrection. A form of prayer was even appointed to be used in connection with it. Pope Paul V teaching his superstitious votaries thus to pray at Easter. Bless, O Lord, with thee this thy creature of eggs, that it may become a wholesome sustenance unto thy servants, eating it in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. Hey, let's just mix paganism and Luciferian satanic practices with the Bible. Yeah, that, that'd be great, wouldn't it? No, friend. That would be an abomination, is what the Bible calls it. Because God hates the things of Satan. Besides the mystic's eggs, there was also another emblem of Easter, the goddess queen of Babylon that was the Rimon or pomegranate. With the pomegranate in her hand, she is frequently represented in ancient metals in the house of Rimon, in which the king of Damascus, the yada yada yada, the pomegranate fruit is that full of seeds. Now, here's a picture that he puts in this book of this pagan woman that's worshipped. You know what that looks like to me? You look at many times the Roman Catholic Church, they call herself the Holy Mother Church. What do they show? They show that exact same picture, but rather than a pomegranate in her hand, it's a cup. And the Roman Catholic Church says, we are the Church of Christ. And their symbol is a woman with a cup. Why is that important? We'll see in a minute when we go to Revelation chapter 17. I could go on and on and on here. There's so much here that I have that I just can't, can't read, but there's just so much here. Um, I'm just going to skip that part. There's not time to go through the whole thing. But eggs, bunnies, hot crust buns, they all have their roots 
in Catholicism. So the Roman Catholic Church. Why an Easter bunny? Bunny is a sign of fertility. And what did they do in this pagan religion? It was all about the fertility god. She was the god of fertility, the one they worshipped. Ishtar and all those. And it was all about fertility. It's all about let's have this pagan festival, let's get drunk, let's fornicate. And when you have a baby, well the woman didn't want the baby. Probably was retarded anyway because she was drunk all the time. You know, you're not supposed to drink when you're pregnant. So that nine months later, around this time, oh, that child would make a great sacrifice to Satan as we threw him into the fire. There was one more verse I wanted to, or thing I wanted to show you from the two Babylons that was important. Let me see if I can find it here because it tells us what the pagans did. Let me read this. Let me read this to you real quick. It says here. It's told to me that every year at Beltane, around the 1st of May, a number of men and women who are Druids that celebrate this pagan religion assemble in an ancient Druidic circle of stones on her property near Kreef. They light a fire at the center. Each person puts a bit of oat cake in the shepherd's bonnet. They all sit down and draw a blindfold a piece from the bonnet. One piece has been previously black blackened. And whosoever gets that piece has to jump through the fire in the center of the circle and pay a forfeit. That is, in fact, a part of the ancient worship of Baal and the person on whom the lot was previously burnt as a sacrifice. Now, the passing through the fire, did you get that? The passing through the fire represents that, the payment of the forfeit which redeems the victim. So when I told you that these ancient pagans would sacrifice their children to Lucifer, to Moloch, by passing them through a fire, by literally throwing into, them fi into the fire their children as a sacrifice to Satan. Ancient history proves it. And when we started this out in Deuteronomy chapter 18, we saw that God says, Do not do like the heathen and allow your children to pass through the fire. So this whole religion, this Babylonian religion, is all about sacrificing your children to Lucifer. And all that is borne out in the pagan festival of Ishtar. Because it's a festival about before 40 days of waiting and weeping. And then once those days are up, you go hog wild. You get drunk. You do orgies. You, you go out, and just like they do in spring break here in America, and get sop, sop drunk and just have sex with everyone in sight. And then when you get knocked up, you say, Here, Lucifer, thanks for letting me have that good time. This baby's for you. It is sick. It is disgusting. It is of Satan and not of God. Now, Catholicism worships a woman. They worship Mary. They worship Ishtar. Paganism worships a woman. It worships Ishtar. Where did paganism get its start? Babylon. So let's go to Revelation chapter 17. I've got to move. I've got to finish this up. I hope you see where I'm coming from. It's all in the Bible. If you just, if you just read, and when you celebrate Easter... You need to ask yourself, am I celebrating the resurrection of the true Christ, Jesus Christ? Or am I allowing myself to celebrate Lucifer through different pagan practices? That's the question. Revelation chapter 17, it says here in verse 1, And there came one of seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed a fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her what? Fornication. This is a woman that's drunk, and she's a fornicating whore. Verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Purple and scarlet, what? Purple and scarlet are the official colors of the Roman, Roman Catholic Church. Hmm, interesting. And it says, And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, where all this pagan religion started that the Catholic Roman Church mixed with Christianity. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great ammunition. If you study the Roman Catholic Church, you'll find that they did horrendous and horrible acts and murdered many, many true Christians. Ever heard of the Spanish Inquisition? All throughout history, 
that false religious whore with her false pagan religion, which she calls Christianity, but it's really the worship of these people. They just changed the name. Has murdered countless millions of Christians. Now, verse, um, verse 7, 8, and 9, look what it says more about this, because we can identify who this whore is. Verse 7, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore dost thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the beast, or the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Verse 8, The beast which thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and shall go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Verse 9, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the whore sitteth. Seven mountains. You go back to ancient antiquity when the Roman Empire ruled. You know what they called Rome? The city of seven hills. The only place on the face of the earth ever known throughout history as the city of seven hills or seven mountains is Rome. Roman Catholic Church. Why do they want to brag so much about Rome? Why Rome was the center of paganism. Why would you want to center Christianity in the very spot where paganism was dispersed worldwide. Verse 18, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. What is the city that throughout thousands of years has reigned over kings and nations and kingdoms? Well, the Pope has sat on his throne in Rome and said, I am Vicarius Fidelium. I am Jesus Christ on the earth. He basically said, I am God. And where is he reigning from? The exact spot that God says is the seat of Mystery Babylon. False religious system. Rome is the only city on earth known as the city of seven hills. It has ruled for thousands of years over kings and countries. It is the center of Roman Catholicism, but it is also the center of the pagan religion of Satan. And it is not hard to see how. And this is why it's called the two Babylons. You have the true Babylon where this false religion started, and then the mystery Babylon, the city that has propagated that religion of Lucifer till this day. Catholicism is not Christian. If you get a chance, get the Jack Chick tract called Are Roman Catholics Christians? That's a good tract because it shows that Christianity is one thing and Catholicism is something completely different. Roman Catholics are not Christians because their practices, their doctrines, their teachings are not biblical. They're pagan in origin. So should we go to Rome and ask her for what to celebrate? No! How can a Christian celebrate Easter if we know what we know now? That many of the practices of this pagan festival are indeed pagan in origin. Why, even the very name Easter is a name of a false pagan god. How can we as Christians celebrate Easter? Well, go to Romans chapter 14. You know, like I said, most people won't even come to church except every now and then they'll show up on Christmas or they'll show up on Easter. Why, well, I, I imagine this Easter Sunday there'll be people showing up in church that you won't see for the rest of the year. Because they think, well, that's the, that's the most important day of Christianity. Well, why is it the most important day? See, I don't think we should call it Easter. I think we should call it Resurrection Day. Because when we use the word Easter, we honor Semiramis. So I don't really like the term Easter. But I like what we as Christians, who are true Christians, remember on that day. Because when Easter comes around, we who are true Christians, we don't remember the eggs, the bunnies, the, the whore. We remember our Lord and Savior who rose again from the dead. And so the Bible says here in Romans chapter 14, verses 5 and 6, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. 6. He that regardeth the day regardeth it to, unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. He that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So we can esteem one day a year, if you want, to remember the resurrection of Jesus. And if you want to do that on Easter, because it's on the calendar every year, praise the Lord. It's important to remember the resurrection of Christ. But we should not give any honor and glory to this whore. We should not give any honor or glory to the mystery of Babylon religion, the religion of Lucifer or Satan. Just like Christmas, Satan has 
trying to trick Christians into celebrating false customs that aren't customs of God, they're of the devil. And many Christians, without even knowing it, when they celebrate Christmas, they're celebrating this false mystery religion, doing the exact same customs that the pagans did, like cutting down trees and decorating them. If we're going to truly serve Jesus Christ, then let's remember what he did. Let's don't remember the devil and the customs that he set up for his false whore religion that focuses on fornication and human sacrifice. I'm going to close this with 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the gospel. You see, we're not saved by going to a church. You see, the Catholic Church says there's no salvation outside of us. Really? Then, then why are you saved from? How are you saved? Well, they say, well, you've got to do this, this, and everything they say is not what Jesus said. They deny the fact that Jesus is the Savior. I didn't read it. <clears throat> I was going to. <clears throat> but this pagan mystery religion says that the Savior is this one, Semiramis, the woman. And Catholicism today has said that Mary is the co-redeemer. And they've lifted and exalted Mary above Jesus. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches there's only one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1-4, we find the gospel. What is the gospel? I guess I'll use a different color here so we can see it. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. Now watch this. That he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is what many churches are celebrating, the resurrection. Unfortunately, they're allowing these other pagan practices to enter in. Like, hey, come to church this Sunday and go for the Easter egg hunt. Oh, come to church this Sunday and we'll have some hot cross buns and we'll all enjoy these cakes that we eat and they're just so good. Hey, I'm going to dress up as the Easter bunny, says the pastor. And you're getting away from the true message of what the day should be celebrated for. We should be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not a false resurrection of a false deity. And that's what paganism is. It's a false Christ and a false resurrection. <sighs> many, many more things that I could say. I was going to read a couple more verses. Last year on Easter, I preached about the importance of the resurrection. And that's what it's about, the importance of the resurrection. If you get a chance, I just ask you to go back and watch that video. I could read many more verses here of how when the early church started and when Paul went out, it's like over and over, and he preached the resurrection. And he preached. That's the important thing, that Christ rose again. Because we're not saved by this religion. We're saved by Christ and his resurrection. So are you saved? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Are you a Christian? Well, how much do you love the Lord? That's what it all boils down to you. If you really love the Lord, why would you mix the most powerful thing, the resurrection of Christ, with the religion of Lucifer? Why would you let your kids decorate eggs? Why would you do Easter Bunny stuff? I went to the mall the other day, and there was the Easter Bunny sitting there. And my little girls looked and said, Daddy, that's, that's evil. And then he, he waved. What a cute bunny waving. And I saw my little one go, Isn't it cute? Isn't the devil cute in his cute little religion? The Bible says he's an angel of light. Well, if the devil showed up to you, you probably wouldn't know he was the devil. He'd look so pretty, an angel of light. And what is he? He's a dirty, filthy, rotten, low-down, good-for-nothing, fornicating, evil person that wants your kids. He wants them sacrificed to him. Well, the resurrection, that's what it's all about. I'm going to close this. I'm going to sing you a hymn, one of my favorite hymns, entitled, Christ Arose. Many churches this time of year, are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And that's what I want you to remember. Don't celebrate the pagan garbage. Just remember Christ who arose. The hymn goes like this. It's entitled, Christ Arose. <clears throat> Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, Waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, he arose.
Heroes with the mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose, he arose, a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose, he arose, a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep his prey, Jesus my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, he arose, with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose, he arose, the victor o'er the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. And that's what it's all about, dear friend, because when he arose, you know what he did? He spit in the face of the devil. He said, you got a false Christ. Yours didn't really rise. You lied and said he did. When Jesus rose from the dead, he proved that he was God. And he showed the devil. <laughs> Your religion's false. I'm the true God. So friend, thanks for watching this video. I hope it's been a blessing to you. If you're a Christian, I hope it's helped you to, to realize that as a Christian, there's some things we can celebrate and we should celebrate and be excited about, like the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there's some things that the world has mixed in with Christianity that have no place. God calls it an abomination. And there are some abominations that are connected with this pagan festival called Easter that we as Christians should have nothing to do with. So I appreciate you watching this. We will see you next week here on the Cloud Church. God bless you, and have a wonderful, wonderful Resurrection Day.